Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen, this is Run It Back, my name is Remco Rinkema and today I am joined by Gavin Griffin, who in 2004 became the youngest ever WSOP bracelet winner, he was also the first ever player to win Poker's Triple Crown, which... I have to admit, has faded a little bit over time <laughs> with 7,000 different poker tours being <laughs> spawning all over the world. But still, the OG Triple Crown, WPT, EPT, and WSP bracelet, Gavin, was the first. And you're joining me today to watch your first ever live cash, which just happens to be a bracelet <laughs> win. Uh, Gavin, first and foremost, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I, does the European Poker Tour even exist anymore? I, I know it was gone for a while and then back. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, they, they canned it for a while. They rebranded <clears throat> and they quickly realized that was a big mistake because the EPT yeah. had so much allure. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this. We'll talk about your EPT win, your WPT win. But of course, the WSOP is what we are here for because we are releasing all this footage on Poker Go. And I think starting tomorrow, Gavin, you can rewatch this every single day because we are putting Perfect. it on Poker Go. So I'm sure your kids are going to be happy to hear that. Get that. Is gonna yeah, be I'm, gonna, I'm gonna force them to watch it <laughs> yeah exactly exactly um but yeah so you know give people some context as to what gavin griffin has been up to lately because i still see results on hendon from recent years but i don't see you as much as you used to be on the tour so um are you still playing poker are you still deep into the game yeah i still play poker um three or four times a week uh almost exclusively cash games i don't i think i haven't played a tournament since maybe World Series 2019. Um, and mostly that's just a, a function of the fact that I have three kids, uh, one that's seven, five, and three. Um, and that sounds better right now. In a couple months, it'll be eight. <laughs> eight, sorry, oh my gosh, seven, six, and three. Oh, that's bad. Wow. He's seven, my, my middle child is six. So in, in a couple months, it's gonna be uh, seven, six, and four for like 10 days. And that sounds really bad. That sounds like we, we just like couldn't help ourselves for a couple of years. Um, but yeah, so mostly I, I take care of my kids now. Uh, my wife works full time. Um, she's the breadwinner in the family these days. So um, so I, I when we're not in quarantine, I take care of my kids during the day, play three or four nights a week. But it's so hard to travel um, with with three young kids that I mostly just kind of play some tournaments in LA if I get to it, or um, if I can get someone to come with me to Vegas, I'll go for the World Series for like a week, um, which is what happened in, I think that was 2019, where I, I, my, I took my parents and my kids and we rented an Airbnb and um, they watched the kids during the day while I was playing, and then hopefully during the night while I was playing, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and um, that was the only way we could really make that work. Wow. So from youngest bracelet winner at 21 <laughs> to father married three kids and trying to balance those lives. We have a lot of road to cover here on this yeah. show. Uh, for the people watching, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Once again, if you have any questions in the chat, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, please don't hesitate to ask all your questions and also make suggestions for any guests you want to see on the show. And I might as well just let you guys know right off the bat here on Thursday, Joe Cata and I are watching his 2009 WSOP main event final table. So the run back train keeps on rolling. But today we are diving into the 04 WSOP, which happens to also be the first ever WSOP that I watched. But that was back in 06 when I first got into poker. Uh, but that's a story I've told many, many times. And I still have the DVDs that have all these episodes. <laughs> so let's crank the intro and uh, get excited for the footage of this uh, WSOP where all the prelims, or at least most of them, were filmed. So let's listen on this intro, which always is exciting. My name's Phil Helmuth. I'm from Palo Alto, California. I'm 39 years old. He's the bad boy of poker. You either love him or hate him, but you gotta respect him. In the most money one department, I'm number one. He's one of the best players in the world. It's gonna be tough to beat him. In the most final table department, I'm number one. I have 32. Wow. He's proven over the years that he is one of the great players. This is my 45th cash this very tournament, which ties me for number one. Yes! He is one of the very best, and he knows it as well. That's fine. Number of bracelets won, I have nine. Helmut wins the championship! But it's tied with two other people. He's accomplished more than maybe anyone has ever accomplished in poker. <laughs> I have a chance to break records, but what I really want the most is to win my 10th bracelet, because that is how you measure poker greatness. Can Phil win bracelet number 10? Find out next. 
All right. Well, we all know you came there to spoil Phil's day at Binion's back in 2004. Um, Gavin, we have to start with this because there is there's a long journey that probably led, it, led up to you being just 21 years old, playing your first ever WSOP, winning a bracelet right off the bat there. How did you end up at the 04 WSOP? Well, I think actually I was 22 at the time. That's not that important. But uh, that this oh. reminded me when he said uh, he's 39. I'm turning 39 this year. And that's like really depressing that I'm like, I felt like when I was 22 and at this time, uh, Phil seems so old to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did I end up there? So, I mean, at, at this point in my poker life, um, I had just, uh, let's say, taken a break from school. <laughs> um, I, I'd taken some time off from college. Um, I was playing mostly limit hold'em at the time. Um, played a few tournaments here and there. Um, and one of my friends was in Fort Worth, where I was. That's where I went to school at, at Texas Christian University. And he was in town, just kind of hanging out uh, with us, playing in the the local games around Fort Worth and Arlington. And he lived in Vegas full time. Um, he was born and raised there. And so he was on his way out to Vegas to go to back to just kind of be done with his trip to, to Fort Worth. And I said, okay, well, I'll come with. And I just crashed on his couch for a week and I was like, I'll just play, you know, an event here or there and, and play cash games or whatever. And, uh, and I played like a 1500 no limit a couple of days before this, um, built up a decent stack and then, and then busted. And then I had just been playing like satellites here and there. Uh, and I'd say at my time, at this time, my bankroll was maybe like, I don't know, $20,000 or something like that. <laughs> so 3000 is pretty big for a tournament. Um, I won a couple of like lammers and some, and some satellites and had a decent cash game win the night before. So I just decided to buy in. Buy into the illustrious 3K pot limit hold'em. <laughs> shout out doesn't to, even exist. Shout out to pot limit hold'em, the worst game ever invented. <laughs> Worse than limit oh, hold'em, yeah. if you ask me. Uh, also, shout out to Terrence Chan, who's in the chat already. And he's saying, I feel like these quotes from opponents will be very different in 2020 with regards to <laughs> Phil Helmuth. Um, I, I do want to ask you, uh, based on that statement from Terrence, how did you really look at Phil Helmuth back in those days? Did you really you know, respect him or was it already sort of an inside joke at that point? Oh, I mean, definitely, you know, Today, Phil might not be as good relative to the field um, as as he was back then. But I mean, at that point, Phil was definitely the best player in the world in tournaments. I mean, nobody really disputed that. Um, I I would say that there were some people who were starting to get better than him. But at, at this point, he was definitely the most one of the most feared p players in tournaments. Um, and I don't think there's any sarcasm. Uh, with, with what anybody was saying at this point. No, but it is funny to see because obviously Phil is still doing it to this day. He was going for mm -hmm. his 10th tenth, his bracelet uh, on this very day that we are watching right now. And if you're just tuning in, we're watching the 3K Pot Limit Hold'em final <laughs> table uh, where uh, Gavin Griffin became the youngest ever bracelet winner. And we're getting the rules here. For anyone paying attention, the rules of, uh, of Texas Hold'em are being explained. Uh, but it is cool <laughs> that Phil went on to keep winning. And he now has 15 bracelets and he's well ahead of his nearest competitors who are still Doyle and uh, Phil Ivey who haven't won a bracelet in many, many years. Ivey winning his last one back in 2014 in a, in a horse tournament. Um, but for you, Gavin, being at your first ever WSOP final table, what was this like? Were you already, you know, fully aware of the history of poker? Um, I, I can only imagine that, you know, Moneymaker really helped you as well as far as, you know, getting deeper into the game and, and realizing that you can also do it. Uh, so what was your relationship with the whole sort of event and its history like? Yeah, so I, I mean, I started playing poker when I got home from college my freshman the summer after my freshman year and i really just like got super into it this is kind of how i do things um when i get into something i get really deep into it so i started reading strategy books i started reading tournament recaps um one of my one of my favorite uh people to read at the time was andy glazer um who was basically the best in in doing tournament recaps at the time um and I remember one of the coolest things about making this final table for me wasn't making the TV show. It was having Andy Glazer write about it afterwards. But the, um, you know, I was definitely paying attention to tournaments at the time, even though I didn't play that many. Uh, I definitely was inspired by Chris Moneymaker because I remember thinking, 
uh, or reading about it and telling my parents like, oh my gosh, the guy who won the World Series of Poker, his name is Chris Moneymaker. Like what is going on? This can't be like a real guy. Um, and then, you know, I've met Chris and, and been around him quite a lot since then. And, you know, he's, he's like exactly what you would expect you know, an accountant from Tennessee to be. <laughs> um, and, and and like just the whole idea of of tournaments wasn't really that high on my list of things that I was doing, but I was definitely paying attention to the to the to the culture of, of, of tournaments at the time. Right. Over the years we've seen various different groups of players while your kids are chiming in, which I appreciate. And yeah, you know, that's about to be there's about to explode into the room, I think. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> totally fine. And and, and when, when I had Chris on this very show, his kids were sitting on his lap watching Daddy play for the very yeah. first time. So that was pretty cool as well. So you know don't hesitate. Um, what I think is really cool about the history of poker and how it sort of developed is that over the years you always had groups of up and coming players, you know? Back in 03, you know, it was Dutch Boyd and Scott Fishman and those guys and you winning in 04. As, as far as you know young and upcoming kids and then over time and i'm taking some big leaps here but you know we've had the germans and we've had you know oh there's yeah. the up-and-coming kids from uh, from from scandinavia which was probably you know 06 07 um what was it like to be a youngster among this crowd and and, and in this setting of binions well i remember um playing in a tournament with daniel negranu at, in tunica maybe around this time maybe like um so i guess this was this was may of 04 and maybe it was either end of the year 04 or early 05 and he was playing uh, this hand where there were two nines on the board um and and he got three bet on the flop and he asked the kid that he was playing against like did you are you do you play online <laughs> and the kid answered yes and he just like immediately called him because <laughs> at the time people who were people who were young and and played online had a certain um stigma attached people thought that online players and young players were bad and only the older players were good so it was it was an advantage as someone who was younger at the time um, because people really underestimated how you played and um, i didn't really you know being in binions was i mean looking back on it it's nice to see that i got to play the last year that that the whole series was at binions and that's just like a um a real thrill for, for me in my career because, you know, most people don't get to experience the history of that place. Um, and having the, uh, having that, like, even though it's kind of gross and you know, the, <laughs> the carpet's disgusting and, and it smells bad, um, having that memory, um, especially as time passes and I forget those smells and, and sights, it's been, uh, it's been nice to have, to have that as something that I can say, you know, I won one of the last bracelets at binions right and and the nostalgia feel of watching it right now is is so apparent you know even even mm -hmm. the, even the color scheme and and, yeah. and even this is this is going to sound insane but we are in 2020 right now even the way people dress and this is <laughs> this yeah. is oh four it's not even that long ago but it's it feels like a, a, a different sort of universe uh the only thing that hasn't changed is uh, phil helmut's antics i think we're missing <laughs> we're missing we're missing out on some let's listen in Phil doing his Phil thing, but inside that prickly exterior <laughs> is a warm and caring person. You don't believe me? Just ask his mom. I have never felt a heart capacity like Phil's. I mean, he is just way out here. <laughs> this is awesome. I'm a family person. And they finally got him to take the, the sunglasses off for, yeah. for when his mom's bracelets. next to him. My husband has one, one of our daughters, Anne, has one, his wife has one. Life has been very good to me, and I'm just so happy with where I'm at. You read my book, Play Poker Like the Pros? No. You know. yeah, I, I started playing poker in college. He said, well, I'm going to drop out of school to play poker. Oh, no! I folded sevens and eights! That wasn't as upsetting to me as it was to his dad. Oh! <laughs> they didn't understand it. They were just freaked out. Can you it, Dad? My dad has an MBA a PhD and a JD. I mean, that's like saying you're gonna deal drugs or something to my dad. I used to say, if there, you really wanna do something and you really believe in yourself, you can do it. Mom, pocket tens, wow. If I win this, I'm going to give my sister my 10th bracelet and I'm going to buy my mother a brand new car. So it, it's, gonna, it's gonna be fun if I can pull it off. Wow. 
Fam Family Man Phil Hellmuth, you, you have to just play that if you get a chance. Um, it also <laughs> does sort of lead me into asking the question, what was it like for your parents to find out that their son was, you know, diving <laughs> into poker and, you know, being here at the, at the smelly Binions? <laughs> yeah, so my, my dad, um, when he was 17, started his career as a firefighter. Um, his dad was a firefighter. His brother was a firefighter. Um, and he continued that career until he was, until he retired, he never did anything else. Um, and for someone to tell their, their dad, who's been a, you know, a, what you would consider a blue collar worker for their whole life, uh, that they're going to play poker for a living <laughs> is, uh, especially since I dropped out of college to do so as well, is pretty tough. Um, Oh, this is this is like one of the only interesting hands of the first like uh, the first forty minutes of the show. All right, so. let's let's break it down. <laughs> what you you raised with King Queen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I raised King Queen of Spades, uh, Ram the Swanee, who's a uh, super tough player at the time. Uh, I don't know what Ram's doing these days, but um, you know, it's funny. He was also at the final table I made uh, in Monte Carlo. Um, so. It's not a very good flop for the pre-flop raiser, but it's also um, I have like a pretty decent like backdoor draws, um, so I took a I took a free card there, um, and I also didn't think he'd probably be defending too many fours in this spot. So so this is where this uh, this raise comes from. <laughs> um, I, I guess I can't really sell it. I have a four that often either, so it's not really that good of a spot, but. Uh, but I, I found a raise here thinking that I, I didn't like his chances of having a four that much, but, um, you know, in pot limit, it's easy to kind of get away with like little raises here and there and try and get away with, um, with, with like bluff raises and, uh, things like that without having to worry too much about, um, committing a lot of pot, uh, chips to the pot, especially when you've, when you've checked the flop. Um, but you know. That was, that was a quick and easy fold. <laughs> so as far as the stack sizes, it, it seems to be very shallow. You were the chip leader at the final table. Yeah, for sure. Um, for Ram to go all in there, were you almost committed or was there a lot of room there to just fold? Uh, I think I was getting at the time maybe close to two to one, but it, it still wasn't. Um, I don't think I was anywhere near a, a getting the right price. Right. I was a little bit upset with myself for making that raise just because... Um, Honestly, like you said, the stack sizes are shallow, but it's pot limit. So there's no, there's no annies at any point. Um, you don't have to have like very deep stacks. Essentially, I mean, it, it's, um, it's pot limit, but it kind of plays with these stack sizes as no limit in, in a lot, in a lot of situations, mostly because we don't have, uh, there wasn't that much post flop play at, at this final table. It, it all tended to be pre flop. Um, so we got like three handed when the stacks were a little deeper because we, we sort of stayed eight, nine handed for like a good chunk of the final table and then busted a bunch of people in quick succession. And then we played three handed for, I don't know, maybe an hour or something like that only. So, um, but the, the stacks were such that we, we could have done so if, if I didn't have a big chip lead, we had enough chips on the table for me, for us to play it out a little bit. Right. But, um, but since I, like the chips were concentrated in my stack, it didn't really work out that way. Shout out, by the way, to Ram Voswani, one of the OG players from Europe. Of course, to the people watching this, and if you ever Googled any results of any poker player, the Hendon Mob is where you probably ended up. Well, that was yeah. Ram Voswani, Joe Beavers, uh, Barney Boatman, um, and um, and I think also uh, uh, Barney's friend, uh, Ross Boatman. Um, but the Hendon Mob, yeah, there they are. There's Ross, there's Barney, and then you have uh, Joe Beavers as well. Uh, they, they were the Hendon Mob for many, many years. Uh, the results website, of course, that spiraled into now being probably one of the most visited poker sites in the entire universe but that's how they got started and if you've watched some of the old ebt footage ram Faswani was almost at every single final table uh, and he i have no idea what he's up to now ram if you happen to be watching dm me we can maybe watch some old footage with you because <laughs> you've been on plenty of final tables um but i think if i'm looking at this right now um for 2004, this was a pretty tough final table. Gabe Taylor had a good reputation, uh, Phil Helmuth, and then, of course, uh, Ram and yourself. Um, were you nervous? Was there a lot of adrenaline? Like, how do you look back on, on how it felt to be there? Um, I, you know, I never really felt nervous. Uh, oh, this is the hand where Phil busts, actually. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we, we, should, we should go audio because we okay. get some good audio here. <laughs> Let's listen in. Let's listen in. Uh, so he limped under the he limped in the small blind. 
Um, I checked the big blind with King five of spades. I think he had maybe, I don't know, three big blinds or something like that. He had just a really small stack. I probably should have, probably should have raised. Um, but I thought he might be limping with something pretty big. And obviously he wasn't. Um, so yeah. And and the funny thing is as well for the ESPN broadcast that we are watching, they stretched Helmut's uh, appearance on this final oh, yeah. table for as long as they could because he <laughs> oh, was yeah. he was of course the big name. Let's listen in on this hand. When you don't have a lot of chips, you can't protect your hand. So Gavin is willing to play because it doesn't cost him a whole lot more. So the cards are flipped. Helmut sees his advantage. And as a three to one favorite, Helmut with a very good chance to double up and get back in the mix here. Neil Johnson, the dealer, by the way, just uh, so people mad yeah, recognize him. Neil ended up working for the uh, EPT for a long time. Right. Gavin can still knock him out with a king or a five or now a spade. And the river card comes. It is a spade. Oh, my goodness. Phil Helmuth, victim to runner, runner again, loses to the flush, knocked out by Gavin Griffin. Let's put all their money in the floor stand ever. <laughs> Three big blinds, guys. Yeah, yeah. All those chips. I knew he's gonna suck out on me. <laughs> Phil's last book was called "Play Poker Like the Pros." His next book should be called "Cry Like a Baby." <laughs> Craving his tenth bracelet, Phil Helmuth goes out in think, seventh place. Knocked I think here comes the good line. The guns, Gavin Griffin in his first World Series of Poker. What the hell, man? I just can't play any better than this. I mean, I cannot play. I played so perfect. It's not even, it doesn't even seem right. It's not. I mean, they got luck. If there weren't luck involved, I guess I'd win every one. If there weren't luck involved, there it is. I there guess it is. I'd win every one. Gavin, you're responsible for one of the single best Phil Helmuth yeah. quotes of all time. Yeah. I mean, that is an all-timer. Um, yeah, it's up there with idiots from Northern Europe and... Uh, and th they can't even spell White magic. They can't even spell <laughs> poker is also yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite ones. Um, but yeah, no, obviously, uh, because it had hand against Ram, you uh, dropped in the chip grounds a little bit. He uh, took over the chip lead. We lost, we lost Phil, and we lost two more players. So I guess we're going to get uh, maybe a recap of that or what? Are we not even going to see how these people busted? Uh, that we showed we showed one person busting, like. Uh, you know, they cut back from commercial and oh, show it. But, right, right, right. Um, you know, the, the funny thing is, like, the, it was kind of crazy because I, you know, this is my first time playing at the World Series, and on on our way to the final table, um, I busted Johnny Chan, um, TJ Cloutier, uh, and then I busted Phil Helmuth at the final table. Um, it was definitely a surreal experience. I never really felt nervous just because I, I don't know, I was too young to be nervous about stuff like that. I guess, you know, at, at that, that point in your life, a lot of times you, you just kind of feel like invincible. Right. So I guess that's how I was, how I was feeling at the time. Um, you know, I was confident in myself. I felt like I was, I, I knew what I was doing, even though I'd never really played that much pot limit hold'em. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, who has? Yeah, honestly. right. No one plays Paul Levin Hold'em ever, <laughs> unless it's a bracelet event. But yeah, that, that that's really that's really cool to sort of look back on that. That quote will forever be associated with you. So, yeah. um, uh, by the way, as as a side note here, while you uh, get involved with pocket eights here um, against uh, Frank Sinopoli, um, where is the bracelet? Is it is it pr a prominent feature? Oh, um, for a while, it was sitting in the, a drawer in my closet. Um, but then we put out like a bookshelf, um, in our office somewhere and, and we had some empty space in it. So I, my wife maybe put it up there. Nice. <laughs> they actually let me keep the cards from the, from the final hand. So those are in the little case. Um, and then my European poker tour trophy is on the, in that same case. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I honestly like when, so when I won the EPT event, they sent me the trophy, but I didn't really want it because <laughs> I, I didn't i mean i didn't really have anything to do with it i mean was like i i don't really like play for trophies you know or, or bracelets or anything like that right um i know it's like kind of cliche to say that you know the money's the only thing that really matters in poker but but that is kind of how i feel uh so i mean would i like to win another tournament like big tournament like this yeah for sure but mostly just because i'd like to have the money that comes along with that um so that's kind of you know, my, my thoughts on the subject. Although when I won the world poker tour event, um, they didn't give you anything at the time. They didn't, they didn't give you like a, a bracelet or a little trophy or anything. I think I got like a chip set and the Borgata gave me a nice watch, 
but but at the the World Poker Tour themselves didn't really do anything. So uh, a couple maybe like a couple years after I won, they started doing some. They did some big ceremony in December where they gave away these Tiffany bracelets to everybody. Um, they're nice. They're they're white gold. They say WPT on them. They've got like a little diamond on the face, and uh, I didn't go to the ceremony. Oh what? <laughs> So that, I was like, well, I wasn't going to be at the tournament they were doing it at. And so I just said, you know, uh, you guys can just give it to me next time I'm in a year in LA or whatever. So I was at the bike for a tournament at uh, the WPT event that used to be there. And um, they, they just handed it to me. And my wife was, was there um, studying for her, her uh, uh, professional engineering exam. And I walked up to her with a Tiffany box and I handed it to her. <laughs> she was not very happy with me. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. Uh, but do you, do, you even, do you even feel as though the sentiments might be changing a little bit now in hindsight, like you're excited to maybe have this as a trophy because in the moment I can totally understand you're 22, you know, what, what's a bracelet going to do for you? But now, of course, it's a memento and the money is probably, you know, spent on a house or buy-ins or tuition and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean it definitely means more now that I have kids, you know, I can be like, Hey, yeah, you know, I won this, you know, this is like one of the more prestigious things you could win as, as a poker player. I do wish I'd wanted a different year. Cause these are the ugliest bracelets that have ever existed. <laughs> yeah. They're, uh, they're like platinum, like, right? Like, like, uh, no, they're, 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 they're mine's yellow gold. The main event one was like, was either white gold or platinum with the diamonds all around the outside. Um, but, but the one that I have is, is yellow gold, but it's got like enamel paint on it. It looks like a, it, it looks like, <laughs> so you can see it there. It looks, it honestly looks like a, a WWE. Oh yeah. I see it uh, now. Belt. It's, it's awful. <laughs> well, that, that is also more historic. The fact that it's awful m makes, yeah. <laughs> it, makes it even more sort of kitschy and sort of like That's weird. True. Yeah. It does. It does seem more like downtown Vegasy. Right. Well, I mean, you have to remember for the people watching, myself included, back in these days, it's it's hard to even fathom, but it was a different universe. They would make right. like these uh, final table jackets that looked like they were straight yep. from the 80s. So it's funny when yeah. you think about it, because 2004 is probably closer related as far as the style to the 80s than it is to now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm, I think I had um, from the Horseshoe Tunica when they had their their events there, I made a final table there. Um and they had these like brown suede jackets that they gave out <laughs> to people at the final table. And it was, I mean, truly also incredibly hideous. I mean, just, you know, I, I think I had I, all the poker star stuff I had, you know, from different events that I went to, I just like, I would just give it away because it's just, it just doesn't look very good. <laughs> well, you have to also realize though that it's now 2020 and all you have to do yeah. is grow a little mustache, wear, <laughs> wear some very light, light colored shades and wear yeah. a brown suede jacket to a hipster That's bar right. in, in California. And you're and totally, right. you totally set. <laughs> so like they were ahead of like the, even the, the jacket Gabe Taylor is wearing that's yeah. like every player in a casino uh, for that entire duration yeah. of the 2000s and this is the ultimate UK sweater the white sort of whatever <laughs> Perry or whatever the brand is called one of those sweaters um, yeah. but it, it is funny to see it through that prism as well um, and of course we're running a little bit ahead as far as the storyline but what happens to someone your age winning a bracelet? You said your bankroll might have been 20K when you won this. So obviously that had a huge impact, you know, on your financial situation, but also on your poker playing. So how did this change mm -hmm. your life, this moment? Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that it changed that much. Um, I still kind of played similar stakes to what I was playing before. Um, I, you know, when I played online, at that time, honestly, playing online, you couldn't play big. Hmm. You know, the biggest game on Poker Stars in 2004, I think, was like 10, 20 limit. You know, like you couldn't really play big games. Right. Um, no limit cash wasn't as popular at the time. Uh, it became more popular once once that uh, the internet, you know, popularized it some more. But and then if you if you the, wanted to play limit holding, you had to play against your friends Terence Chan and Matt Harolenko, which yeah, wasn't yeah, the greatest. Yeah, either. exactly. Um, you know, I. So I, it didn't really change, honestly, that much. I, you know, maybe I played 4080 instead of 2040 like I was playing live. Um, but it wasn't really a huge change to my life um, overall. <laughs> <laughs> Gabe gets a three. Gabe, Gabe uh, is one of, maybe like one of the all-time LA cash game killers. Uh, he, he 
played every time I'd see him in LA, he'd be playing 50, a hundred, no limit, you know, 40, well, I guess it was 40, a hundred in LA cause they used the $20 chips. But, um, yeah, I mean, he, he, uh, I'm not sure what he's up to again, you know, this is 15 years later, so who knows what people get up to, but, uh, at the time he was definitely one of the, one of the best cash game players around. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting also. I mean, I watched every single one of these bracelet events as well as all the main event footage and Gabe Taylor was always one of those guys that on the broadcast, they made him seem very intimidating and very good. And then when you, <laughs> yeah. and, and then when you watched him, his style and the look that he had in his eyes also felt intimidating. So yeah, clearly being on these broadcasts also helped him a lot for his persona and his image. Um, can, can you say also that becoming known as a poker player helped you in your career? And, and what was it like to become famous? So to say, maybe, maybe, maybe famous in the niche, but still you became kind of well-known. Yeah, there were definitely some situations where it, it was, uh, it, it was helpful. Um, this is funny that I was like concerned about ace queen in these situations. Uh, like t right now you get three bet with ace queen and you're like, Hey, <laughs> um, anyway, so the, uh, uh, it definitely gave me some sort of intimidation factor. I think, I think I got more walks in the big blind than your average person for a while. Um, but then it, you know, there is some, some version of people coming after you, which, which is good. Um, you, you always, if you can have someone making decisions based on, on like their emotions in that situation, as opposed to, you know, how they should actually be playing the hand, that's always good. So, uh, I, I think it's definitely, if you can handle it correctly, if you can, if you can understand how to adjust to people changing how they play against you, then, um, then, it, then definitely is helpful. Right. Biggest flip of your, of your life right here. <laughs> uh yeah probably turn card three of clubs griffin with a straight draw now and ram down to needing a jack or a 10 or his day is over and now the river card comes yeah! into six of diamonds not going to be good enough for ram Boswani. gavin griffin knocks out another player and Boswani from the hendon mob will have to wait another day to get that championship bracelet he's gone in fifth place i don't really remember the context griffin, though, at the time but it seemed like i was really frustrated with with how things were going maybe because um because of the way i reacted to to ram three betting me there it seems like a odd spot to be upset about getting three bet <laughs> right uh, i do want to listen to this little segment here to see what you <laughs> what, what you had to say back in those days oh, boy. i'm sure it's uh, insightful <laughs> fifth place gavin griffin though is one step closer to making world series of poker history My name is Gavin Griffin, I'm 22, and I'm from Darien, Illinois. I've been playing poker for probably three years. I had a pretty decent run online for the last few weeks, so I decided to come out and take a shot. If I win, I'd be the youngest player ever to win a bracelet, and that's been something I've been interested in for a while. I'm confident in my abilities. Um, I, would, I wouldn't have played if I didn't think I could make it this far. I only have one thing in mind, and that's winning. And if he does win here today, Gavin Griffin will break Alan Cunningham's record from 2001 as the youngest. Alan Cunningham's record from 2001. Wow. You know, it's funny because I, I set the record here and then I think the first week of the 2005 World Series, it was broken and then just it just got broken like <laughs> constantly after that. Right. I remember Steve Villarocas breaking it in, in mm -hmm. 07, I believe. It was like some mixed Holm event or something. Um I couldn't even I couldn't even tell you who has it now. I know I know that it keeps getting broken yeah, every time. I have time. no idea. And also the metric has changed because European players, mm -hmm. you know, Adrian Mateos won a bracelet when he was like 19 or whatever it was. So um, that'll that'll forever <laughs> change the way that goes. Um, but then you win a bracelet, you win this event, and I'll please interrupt me if the uh, hands get exciting. You're I think okay. you're, are you three betting here where they say? Yeah. Gavin Griffin pushing <laughs> once again, trying to clear wow. this table. Boy, he has been doing just that. Gabriel Thaler folds. Tom Lee, he, I think away. I think Tom like opened for for like fifty percent of his chips or something like that from the button. So, like I said, most of, most of these hands tend to be pretty pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> that that's why it's good to tell the story because the story yeah. is is far more interesting than uh, the hands. There was a there was a fun hand on the way to the final table um, where uh, T J Cloutier. Um, so I open TJ Cloutier, like three bets me from, from the cutoff. I have ace king and I, I four bet 
for most of you know for the pot and he he goes all in and he says uh you know he says i like his hand <laughs> which i was happy to hear because that was for basically the chip lead of the tournament with like 16 people left wow. um and it, you know in 2004 getting in like four bets with ace king wasn't always as as good for you as, as it could be these days so um so he, he turned over king nine and and i was just like blown away <laughs> i mean because <laughs> that's not really something you saw that often i feel as though that hand is a microcosm of why tj cloutier won 10 million dollars playing live tournaments yeah because <laughs> yeah, he was for the, sure he was the only one crazy enough to stick it in there with king nine yeah, absolutely um and of course you know he picked the wrong guy but most people I mean, I've seen so much footage from back in these days and people are folding ace queen to a raise. Like it's, it's insane. The stuff you saw back in the day. Well, like earlier in the tournament, just as a similar, in a similar situation where, um, Phil Hummuth raised and I three bet him with ace 10 suited and he just folded ace king face up, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just to a single three bet, you know? So people definitely at, at the time it was, uh, if you had the, the style that TJ had, which, which was a little more aggressive than most people. Uh, it was obviously, you know, very, very uh, profitable. Right. All right. Three handed here with uh, Taylor and and uh, Gary Bush. The three G's going at it for the bracelet <laughs> here. Um, as far as you getting into the European Poker Tour and, and, and mm -hmm. you know traveling more for these big live events, was it just a matter of you know playing those satellites and getting into those events, or were you determined to you know be a feature on the tour and play all these big buy-in events? Well, you know, it was a it was a poker stars led. Uh, this is actually an interesting hand. If you want to pause it for a second, yeah, like for sure, the, yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. So, so it was you know the poker stars was the only was basically the only game in town at the time. Um, if you were an American player, so they and they had all their satellites to European poker tour events, and I, I qualified for the PCA um, every year from oh four. And actually, the reason I, the reason I quit school is because uh, I quit my job at the time. Um, as a poker dealer is because I won a seat to the PCA in 04. Um, and my, my, the casino I worked at dealing wouldn't give me the time off. So I just quit. <laughs> um, and so I, that was the first PCA, the one where it was on a cruise. Right. And so I, I went on that and then I qualified for every PCA from 2004 through 2011 or 12, I think including the ones where, you know, I was sponsored by poker stars at the time, but the, uh, the, the European poker tour events were just good satellites, honestly, the, um, you know, I like that double shootout format that they used to have. Um, I don't know if they'd still do that or not. Uh, but the, the double shootout format I, was, was good for me. I, I came up playing single table tournaments a lot of the time. Um, like that's where I got my introduction into tournaments. So I was mostly a limit holding player and then single table tournaments on party poker were just like so soft that, that I played those a lot. Um, and then, so that format works well. If, if you're, if you're good at those, you're gonna be good at the double shootout. So I won, I just ended up winning that, that Monte Carlo seat. And I think I was the first person to qualify for EPT Monte Carlo that year on <laughs> poker stars. Um, because I, it, it was the first seat and nobody, one of the reasons I played it is because there's an overlay because nobody was getting in it because it was, you know, I don't know, months later that the tournament was going to be. Right. So I, uh, so I won that and I'm just like sitting in the lobby for, for months, like waiting to figure out what the heck I'm going to do. You know, my first time in Europe, my first time, um, like playing anywhere other than the U S honestly. So it was, uh, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a conscious decision. It was just, oh, I'm playing these satellites for the PCA at the time. Um, and so I'll, I'll just jump in this one for, for Monte Carlo as well. Right. All right, let's dive into this hand, and then we'll continue a little bit more about the, uh, the Monte Carlo tournament. Gavin Griffin, uh, seven so this five. was an odd one where Gabe limps the button with a six. Gary completes in the small blind, and I check the big blind. Six, four, and four. Four. A little bit for everyone, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> so at this point, I, I don't really have like a, a plan to, to do anything funky in this situation um because i think it's possible that gabe um is lending with a big hand as that was something that people did at the time for some reason um but i don't really think this is a hand that this is a flop that hits him that well um if he's limping you know i absolutely did not think he would have a six in any situation um so and especially when he raises i'm thinking he has like uh, either some sort of like limped monster or um, 
or he's just he's limped with like queen jack or something like that and he's raising as a bluff right and you just have enough equity to even get stuck against a good hand because yeah it, it, my my thought at this point is i i can very credibly represent a four or even better than that uh and it's pretty hard for him to have one and even if he has some sort of hand like you know tens or something like that i still have a a, a decent amount of equity against him right where that bet came from and I've definitely played it in a way that is consistent with having a four. Mm -hmm. You absolutely have to have a four. <laughs> I mean, what do you, you're not going to raise it with a six. You don't have two sevens. You'd raise it for the fall. And uh, Gavin Thompson, elementary school maneuver here to block his face so he can't see what he looks like. <laughs> exactly what I was thinking. I mean, uh, G Gabe just burning equity there, raising for information, and basically giving up his hand there. Um, yeah, I mean, this is... You know, I, I had people, friends at the time who would say, oh, well, I got to raise to find out where I'm at. And I'm like, well, raising to find out where you're at is just going to give you like whatever information you're looking for. You know, the person can decide to, to tell you what, what you want to hear. Um, it's not really. <laughs> God. What is this? I mean, this is it's the, the, it's the nuts. The, let, the, let, they're old like. Uh, let's see what the nuts novelty. is. What the nuts is about. <laughs> I think this stuff. one's the uh, the one card, like the uh, the one card poker thing that they did. I think. I'm pretty sure. Let's see. Historic proportions. This is the greatest event in the history of mankind. <laughs> the strongest players in the world have come together. It's going to be the hardest mentally tough thing I've probably ever done in my life. This is poker at its highest level. This is blind man's bluff. It's going to be a war. I remember it as one, one card. They did like... Full hands. Wow, shout out. Shout out to Amir Vahidi. Is this a closed game or can anybody play? Chris Moneymaker? <laughs> Chris Moneymaker trying to crash the game. Are they going to let him? Uh, this is a bunch of hooey. We've had people sitting here for hours. You have to, put it, you have to take your hat off, though, because you have to put it to your head. Anytime Coney says take something off, you take it off, all right? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> well, I didn't really expect that from Lon. Yeah. That's more of a, that's more of a Norm Chad uh, type line. <laughs> this is so funny to see. Oh, now it gets worse. He brings Mattisau with him. That's a bad beat for us. Two chips. That's all it's going to take for me to bust you guys. Okay. Four players. Two chips apiece. I'll tell you where you can stick those. Mattisau's awareness of the cameras, the moment, and how that would oh, impact yeah. his life is just incredible. He's really, I mean, it's, it's, uh, you see it, you see it all throughout these broadcasts where Helmuth is just like, I mean, it's <laughs> where Mattisau just like, <laughs> just like butts himself into every situation. Exactly. And, and Scotty Wynn wearing what I, th I believe is one of the nicest blue long sleeve uh, sweaters that I've ever seen. Oh, it's a short sleeve. I thought it was a long sleeve. Damn. <laughs> Amir Fahidi, by the way, shout out to him. Legend as well from uh, the early days of uh, WSOP. Yeah, Scotty, you know, I think, if I remember correctly, Scotty uh, was, uh, Mattisau had a big piece of Scotty when he won the main event. Correct, yes. Cause, and he was on his rail, like, hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Wow, Moneymaker looks so young, too. Um, we, all, we all look young back then. I mean, it's really... <laughs> I mean, 2004, I was, uh, let me think. I was like 17, so. Yeah. Or, no, I turned, no, sorry, I was 19. I turned 21 in 06. Um, so we did We did actually make a deal three-handed. Um, well, right when we got three-handed, we were pretty even in chips. So we, uh, I think we each, I think I took like 100, uh, I think I took 130, and they each took 110, and then we played for 100. Oh wow, that's still quite a lot to play for. Yeah, yeah, we wanted to leave something where where we had, you know, a good. And this is back when they actually facilitated that for us. What? Um, they changed that? I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure my tax forms say, you know, 240, not 270, which was the official. Right. Uh, so I'm pretty sure. Back then, they 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 facilitated it. It's just once they once they got bought out by um, by Harrah's that they they didn't have that anymore. That's so crazy. I mean, I thought that they just never had that option because obviously it's it's better for the players to allow deals. Oh yeah. Um, and of course, it's it's better for the broadcast not to mention it, but it's better for the players to have the ability to do so. Um, so then, we're yeah, the big the big difference was they um, they. I think 
Oh, that's what it was. So you couldn't you couldn't deal the bracelet. Right. So you couldn't say, all right, well, I'm just gonna win. You know, I I win. You you can you can have the bracelet for whatever. I'm gonna give you one. That was the only thing they wouldn't let you do. I mean, you could if you wanted to, I guess. Um, but but they they did have a restriction where they they wouldn't let you deal for the bracelet. But the um, I get this is some pretty funny audio for the last couple of seconds because I actually limped in. Um, Maybe which was fortune. pretty odd for me at the time. <laughs> right. Get some jacks now. Give some uh, but yeah, the, uh, the, the deal, I probably, I probably gave up a little bit more than I should have in the deal. Um, I think I had a small chip lead. I took like 20,000 extra. And we played for more. I mean, it was, you know, it was my first time winning anywhere near this amount of money. So having, um, having that kind of pressure off my shoulders definitely helped. Right. And then, you know, I, I still want to go back to the Monte Carlo story because of how much bigger that was as far as yeah. a, a win goes. Um, it, it's sort of funny. It blows it out of the water. I, I mean, on your, on your hand and mob, this has 270K. And then Monte, yeah. Ca Monte Carlo is 2.4 million uh, US, yeah. um, 1.8 million euros. So Yeah, I made a mistake. I should have left it in euros because the, the euro made like... 30% in the next year or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I, you're right. I mean, it's pretty insane how the exchange rate was. I think 09 is when it peaked, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so playing a 10,000 euro event, which was probably, what was it, like 16, 17K or, or something like that was an enormous... I think, uh, I, think at the, I think in 07, it was like 1.5 to 1. Okay. So yeah, it was about a 15K buy-in, yeah. 15K US buy-in. Um, how different was that experience? Like much more money on the line, but you've also had sort of been there before as far as winning a big tournament. So how different was that? Yeah, I mean, at this point, I've already played it. So in, in 04, at the time of this tournament, um, I haven't really played a lot of like big buying tournaments. You know, this is the biggest tournament I'd played at the time. Uh, then I played the main event in this in 04, and I played the main event every year from 04 through to, um, I don't know, 2016 or something like that. And so by the time we got to 2007, I'd already played a lot of, you know, $10,000 buy-in events. Um, and I didn't really feel the pressure in that regard. And also by day three, I think it was of the Monte Carlo main event, I was, I had just like an awful cold. Um, so I didn't really have the, the mental capacity to think of anything other than actually playing the tournament. Um, it's funny because the the EPT and the WPT event that I won, both of them, I had a pretty pretty bad cold like halfway through, um, and and it I don't know, did something to like focus me, I guess, where where I, I couldn't think about anything else other than playing poker because I just didn't have the energy at the end of the day or or uh, any of that stuff. Here we go, Taylor Allen with Queens against your sevens. Gary Bush folds. Now it's up to Griffin to call or get out of the way. He's in already for 60,000. And he's gonna call it and a chance to knock out another player now for Gavin Griffin. Uh, he's hoping Gabriel Thaler didn't have a higher pair and he does. <laughs> so Gabe, Gabe and I became pretty good friends over the course of this uh, tournament. Um, you know, we'd see each other after this for like the next several years, always say hi. Um, I'm not the most social guy at the table. Um, I never really have been, but it, it's, uh, and he, he's like so approachable, even though he's got those crazy eyes, you know, he's like, <laughs> he's just a really nice guy in general and very, very talkative. And, um, it was, it was a nice experience to have, to have someone like him, you know, be, he was almost like a mentor for me for a couple of years. Cause he's, you know, he's not that much older than me. Um, and he was one of those guys that kind of bridged the gap between, the live players and the online players as, as well. You know, he was like in that in between time where where you could still be um, just like a pure live poker player uh, at that point. Right, and and he somehow managed to be successful for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's interesting also to know more about his story. So if I ever get a chance to speak to him, I'd, I'd love to learn more about his career. Um, his last cash in a live event dates back to two thousand and eight. So he hasn't yeah. played any uh, live events. So maybe he's still playing cash, but who knows um, what he's been up to. I mean, I, I don't spend that much time in the LA casinos. I tend to go uh, more towards San Diego, but um, I, I hadn't seen, when I, the times I was up at, in LA, I hadn't seen him in a long time. 
Right. So yeah, my maybe... presumption was he wasn't really. He's either playing, you know, private games that that uh, um, that I wasn't privy to, or he was he was just out of poker, basically. Right. Uh, so then back to the uh, the big Monte Carlo win. Mm -hmm. um, having a cold is, is a good distraction. I mean, Dario, Sam <laughs> Dario Sammartino finished second in the main event last year in Vegas, and he was deathly sick for probably, oh, yeah. you know, five straight days. And th that he also said, you know, I couldn't think about anything other than the cards that yep. I had in front of me. So that worked for you as well. But then you're playing for, you know, literally millions of dollars, which is actually coming from a satellite win, you know, the most, oh, yeah. the, the biggest boost imaginable to someone's life in bankroll. Yeah, we talked. Um, uh, we talked deal. Mark Karam and I uh, at some point, and we couldn't really get it worked out. So we ended up on the last hand of that tournament, uh, flipping a coin for like an actual million dollars. I mean, wow. it was, it was, you know, I had I had two over cards and a straight draw against his top pair, an open and a straight draw against his top pair. So we we just like we just flipped for for. A million cash and it was uh, and i didn't even think about it at the time you know it's just we're in the middle of a hand I, I i i just got to the point where where i've i've raised a two million on the flop uh and he goes all in for like four four point something million and if i had lost the pot i would have had maybe like three big blinds left or something you know it's for almost the entire amount of chips in play and it was just a just a pure coin flip for a million and i was like <laughs> Someone mentioned that on two plus two later, and I was like, "Oh God, I guess that's I guess that's true. I didn't really think it that way." <laughs> that I mean, that is an insane way to think about it, especially when you have no deal. Like the the, the jump yeah. from second to first is always enormous, but especially with the exchange yeah. rate and you know the being a qualifier, it, it makes it even bigger. And, and back then, you know, price price structures were were much much more top heavy. Right. You know, like it's a lot it's a lot flatter now. Um. Especially, you know, I mean, I think maybe they, I think they still only paid like 10% of the field at that point, uh, which was odd for like a, a, a tournament where you have a lot of qualifiers from online. Usually those types of tournaments, they tend to spread out the, the bottom end of the, of the pay structure a little more. Right. Um, there's a lot of stories out there of players that win millions of dollars early in their career and then, you know, push, push, push and realize that they have to build back up and stuff like that. Were you smart with, with your win? Like, were you actually grounded and, and sort of sane enough to, you know, approach that lifestyle the right way? Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I guess, I guess, uh, sort of, um, I, uh, I didn't, like I said, I didn't start playing like huge, huge limits, but I never really pieced out on anything either. So I didn't, if I played tournaments, I was, I had a hundred percent of myself, wow. um, which I, looking back, I probably would have done differently. Um, you know, I eventually ended up getting a backer for, I, I mean, I've had a backer for tournaments since 06 or 07, I think it, it's been. Um, so, so I eventually kind of realized the, the the idea that that maybe it's better for me to have like some piece of my action uh offloaded onto somebody else um but i i'd say it was sort of good sort of bad. i didn't like buy anything except for like a car i didn't i didn't like uh i didn't start playing like 100 200 no limit right. or something like that i would take a shot at like you know 100 200 limit every once in a while if there was a good game but mostly i played pretty well within my bankroll except when it came to uh except when it came to you know, not piecing out in tournaments. Big moment right here. 22 years old, becomes the youngest ever to win a championship bracelet at the World Series of Poker. That's the guy whose house I was yeah, staying at. Oh, that's awesome. I've ever played. I'm disappointed I never won it. But I live to fight another day, but he was fantastic. Phil Helmuth expected to make history tonight, but the unknown... Still lead with Phil even after I win. Of course. <laughs> you know, I got lucky against him in, in his pot, and there was nothing else to it. It may have been luck, but it gave Gavin the confidence to add four more players to his growing body count. I think I made maybe two mistakes yesterday and today, and it just just worked out. After making quick work of Gary Bush, history was made, and he is now the youngest ever to Dude, win the World Series. So ugly. Man. <laughs> I've always felt like I play limit <laughs> poker pretty well, and I made enough money to pay my bills, and I did a little bit better this time. At 22, Gavin Griffin becomes the youngest of the young guns to win at the World Series of Poker. Wow. So, 
I got really that that picture right there. If you me holding the money over my head, right? Um, that is very not me. <laughs> <laughs> I would like never do that on my own. Uh, but they're doing the, they're taking the pictures for for like the, they used to put up every brace at winter. Like they put up a picture on the wall, um, and so they're taking the pictures, and they're like, oh, you know, hold up the money. And I was like, I don't really want to do that. That's not really something that I would do. Uh, like, oh, it's, it's just one picture, you know, no big deal. And so I, I did it. And then that's the picture they used to put up on the wall. Of you course. Know, like, <laughs> I was pretty, I was pretty disappointed that that, that was the one they used. But um, even, so then from, from then on, I just like, I would just say no, if they asked me to do that again. Cause I knew that, that I think, so the other thing you won at, at Borgata that year that I won um, besides the nice watch that they gave me, uh, was a Harley. <laughs> wow. That's, that's kind yeah. of insane. Yeah. Which, uh, I never actually got uh, It's a weird story, but, um, I, I held up the keys to that when I won it, uh, and that, but I held them like down here, you know, I didn't hold them like up with my head, like, like in the, <laughs> wait, there was no, there was no photo up with the Harley. Well, come on. Like, how can you No, do... I know. So they had, they had like the Harley out in the hallway outside the studio um, outside the world poker tour set and you could see it on the way in. Um, but then they just had like the keys on the, and at the Borgata, apparently in New Jersey, they're, they're not allowed to put, um, real money on the table for, for those situations. So it was all like, it's like bundles of fake money. Right. Um, and, but it, on top of that was the watch and the keys that, that for the, for the Harley, um, and so I just, yeah, I just held up the keys, but I never, I kept trying to contact them. I was like, Hey, I don't really want a Harley. Cause I'm, that's not really my thing. Um, so I was like, you know, can I, can I work out a way where I can, you guys can just send me the money or I, I have at one point was going to like give it to my brother, uh, but they couldn't ship it or all kinds of weird stuff. Like, so finally I just ended up getting some cash for it. Wow. After, after like a year or something. <laughs> Wait, there, there's like, there's a missed opportunity here for a cross country road trip on right, a Harley. Here we go. And there's, and. Do you want to watch the bonus features? Do you want to watch the bonus features? Yes, you can watch the bonus features. Look, who's that? Who's that on this TV? Is, this is Isabel. Hi, Isabel. Isabel, who's that? Do you recognize that person? No, <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> That's what Daddy. That's Daddy. That's Daddy? Yeah. <laughs> who's that? This? This is Remco. Hi. Can you say hi to Remco? Hi. Nice to meet you, Isabel. <laughs> your, da your daddy plays poker and he plays it pretty well. And he won he won a big tournament. That's what we were oh, watching she's today. She's gone. She's gone. She's out of here. All right. See ya. <laughs> see ya. Thought I did the introduction. I mean, I don't know. Never done a podcast with kids, but you know, obviously, obviously, I can still learn. Um, but yeah, missed missed opportunity there. Uh, for the people who are still watching, um, please take a screenshot of Gavin Griffin holding up the money and put it <laughs> put it Photoshop him on a Harley if you can. Um, it's yeah, perfect. At, it's at nhgg if you can uh, make that work. That'd be awesome. Um, but that that is really Wait, funny. It'll be like my uh, Phil Helmuth riding a hot dog on water picture. Exactly. That that would be just like that. <laughs> or Phil Helmuth crashing a NASCAR into a, in the only right. light light pole on the entire Rio <laughs> parking lot, which is also incredible. Um, but then as you as we've run through this footage, and you of course win Monte Carlo, and then become the first ever uh, Triple Crown winner in the World Poker Tour, and you know you become a, a Poker Star sponsored player. Um, would you say that those things didn't mean anything to you because of how, you know, you looked at stuff, you know, like winning a bracelet didn't really matter. Winning a trophy. I don't really want it. Harley. Yeah. You can keep it. You know, all those, <laughs> all those accomplishments, you know, were propped up as being something really big, but the way you make it sound as though, you know, that wasn't really anything you cared about. Um, yeah. I mean, at the time, um, looking back on it, it's nice to have the, the context of, of, of winning those things and having those accomplishments. And like I said, being able to tell my kids that I did something that nobody else had done at the time. Um, but yeah, I just, it's not really, it's not really the type, like a thing that I think about that often. Um, you know, the trophies sitting in our office kind of tucked away, the bracelets sitting over there. Um, the WPT bracelet that they gave me is, is still in my underwear drawer. Um, I tried at one point to put the, the World Series bracelet around my dog's neck and use it as a dog collar, but it was too heavy for her. Um, so I, it hasn't really changed my, my, thought, my thoughts on that to me. Like I'm not, um, I'm not really driven by that type of, by that type of thing. Um, 
but it is nice, like I said, to have something that I can I can show my kids. Be like, hey, you know, I won this tournament, and and this is something that I I did. You know, this is what I did with my life. Um, although I did, you know, end up going back and finishing my degree, so that I didn't want it to be clear to my kids that um, that you don't need school to do to be successful in life. I I, I want them to know that that it's true that like you know not everybody who's successful in life has has a college education and college isn't for everyone but i also didn't want them to think that life is easy without a college degree right. <laughs> so i went back and got my my college degree um after after my son was my, our oldest was i think 10 months old so wow so then now looking back on your career even though you're still playing are you proud of anything you know, above the other, or are you just happy with the way it worked out? Like, how do you look back on all these accomplishments, which clearly, you know, were pretty big moments? Um, I think in the context of poker, the thing I get asked about the most is the World Series win, even though to me that wasn't, you know, that that's a, a, a much smaller thing than winning either the World Poker Tour or the European Poker Tour. Um, You know, I, I beat bigger fields in both of those events, the competition, uh, although in 2004, this was a, a tough field. Um, the competition in, in 07 and 08 was pretty tough. I mean, I, I watched back the European Poker Tour final table not that long ago, and man, there, there were some really good players at that table. Um, you know, Christian Kondal and um, Mark Karam so and Graham Baswani. So, yeah, Thorin, I mean, he's great. Uh, so there, there was like Josh Prager, who's who's still had some success over the years. So it's been, um, there was definitely a, uh, uh, for me, the the EPT is the most prestigious one. The one that I, I look back on the most and say, hey, that was that was my biggest accomplishment in poker. Wow, that's awesome. And then do you still have aspirations in the game or is it more so, you know, it's it's a, a good way to make a living and, and poker is just something that you still enjoy and you can still beat the games or are you actively looking to uh, find a reason not to play anymore? Um, hmm. I, I think it's, I don't think I'll ever stop playing poker um, even if I were to, you know, start to do something else where... Um, You know, whatever that ends up being, I still think I'd probably play on Friday nights. You know, when the games are good, um, just a way to supplement supplement my income. But you know, it's, to me, um, poker's just always been a way that I can be, like, have a, a free schedule to do the things I want to do. Like, for instance, taking care of my kids full time, um, while also making enough money to like add a little bit of of income to our, even if I'm only playing, you know, these days, 20 hours a week or something like that, that's still, you know, a decent amount of money that I can add to, to like our family's income. So that if we want to take vacations or if we want to go, you know, do whatever, whatever fun thing we want to do this year, that we have that uh, as an option. Um, I, I mostly do it because I enjoy the flexibility that it affords that I can, you know, yeah, sure. If I play a Friday night or a, a Tuesday night and I'm up until two o'clock in the morning and then I got to get up at six with my kids to get them ready for school. That's, that's pretty, pretty tough to deal with, but I'd rather that than have to send them to daycare during the day. Or, you know, I, I like being able to say that we can, that we're, we're taking care of our kids like full time right. um, without having to incur the extra expense and, and other things that come along with like kids going, uh, There by by someone else. So. Right. As as far as the the skill curve of, of poker and your own skill curve, um, would you say back in '04 you were you know far ahead of the game? Would you would you consider yourself among the best? And if the peak was somewhere in between there and now, where was that? What, at what point were you the best compared to the field? I think probably around around '07 '08 is when I was. The best compared to the field. Right. I think I'm a, I'm a better player now than I was in 07, 08. Um, 04, tournaments wise, I didn't have as much experience as I did by the time I got around to, to 07, 08. Um, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, I guess I, I'm, I'm picking the time when I was most successful, which is probably not necessarily true that I was best relative to the field at that time. It just how I performed w was very good. Um, 
But I do think that in 04, in tournaments, I was definitely very good compared to the field when I was playing my best. There were a lot of times from like 04 to 06 where I just kind of like punted off stacks in just ridiculous situations because I, I, I got a little overconfident um, through there. And 07, 08, I'd already gone through some like the, the, you know, a decent little downswing, realizing that I wasn't, I wasn't uh, as good as I thought I was maybe. Um, and so at that point, both my mental game and, and my actual like skill as a poker player lined up really well to, to put me in position to win. Right. Um, these days, I, I mean, I think I'm still probably a winning, I think I'm still a winning player in tournaments that aren't Hold'em. Um, I'm not sure if I'm a winning no limit hold'em tournament player anymore, but I don't really play no limit hold'em tournament. So uh, at least on the biggest stages, in in like smaller, you know, if I'm playing like a, a my local casino has thousand dollar buying tournaments like a couple times a year, and I think I'm, I'm I'm a winning player in those. But you know, at the at the biggest levels, I don't I'm not sure if I am in no limit anymore. Oh, but it's really cool to see that you've managed to build a life that goes hand in hand with poker and then you know giving yeah. more time to your kids because of poker is also a really cool thing to see and you yeah. know in in some kind of way the first young guns of poker are now all grown up and you know have <laughs> yeah. family lives and terrence is still in the chat and i know he's you know living yeah. living that dad life as well so um that right. is really cool so um you know th thank you for the entertainment over the years because i do remember watching your um, EPT win and, and, you know, for, for me in Europe, watching EPT was sort of like the standard. I think I've watched all of them uh, even back in those days. And then, you know, diving into all the old World Series footage has been a lot of fun. So thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been it's been fun to look at uh, baby me and, and see uh, <laughs> see what that was like. It's been I think it's probably been I don't know over ten years since I've I've watched this show. So that's awesome. Well, I mean, at least when you come back to the World Series in the future years and you win like a stud bracelet, you'll give us something else to watch. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're putting too many stud stud events on TV uh, anymore. <laughs> well, Poker Go is going to broadcast most of them. So um, all right, that that that's going to be the good thing about Poker Go. And for the people who are still with us here watching please know that we are loading all these prelim events from the 2004 wsop onto poker go so along with all the main events that we've put on there so 2003 all the way up to 2019 all those main events are on poker go and in in, in this week we're doing all four bracelet events and we're going to do a few more in the coming weeks and then making sure the whole database is complete so if you are a poker fan like myself and like gavin you can dive in back and watch all these episodes and please let me know at remco Rinkema on twitter who else i should have on this show coming up on thursday 8 p.m eastern time joe Cata and i are watching the 09 main event final table so Plenty more good action to come from right back for Gavin Griffin. My name is Rem Karinkama. Thanks all so much for watching, and I'll catch you guys on Thursday night.